Mikel Arteta is Arsenal are under massive pressure after three league games without a win became four, with Chelsea holding Arsenal to a 1 1 draw. So, from the tactical battle at the bridge to the returning Martin Odegaard and a very impressive Mikel Marina cameo, the truth behind Arsenal's problem in attack and where we go next in the title race. As per, let's break it all down and discuss the five things we learned from Chelsea 1 Arsenal 1. Yo, what is going on guys? My name is Buzz 14 welcome back to your boys channel and right now times are a bit tough as Arsenal fans, there's so many thoughts in the mind, so much to break down, so as per, smash a like on the video if you do enjoy and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Help your boy on his road to 300,000 subscribers. We're starting off with the tactical battle. Up against Enzo Moresca's Chelsea at Stamford Bridge. At a ground the Chelsea had lost just once this season, that being against Man City. It was always going to be very different to last season. Having beat them 5 0 at the Emirates Stadium, grasped a 2 2 at Stamford Bridge. This Chelsea side had a lot more threat and a lot more quality, that's why there was always going to be a tactical battle. In terms of the stats, it was actually very even. Chelsea's 1.1 XG to Arsenal's 1.2, 51% of the Arsenal possession, with slightly more final third entries and a slightly more expected threat created. Arsenal also slightly edged the field to at 56% with waves of pressure in the first half and right towards the end. I would say the first half was very balanced because both teams had their moments. Arsenal going into the half, having the Havertz offside goal, missing the chance from Gabriel Martinelli. But then you had Pedro Neto versus Ben White, causing him problems with a fantastic cross, which Chelsea could have easily scored from. For an Arsenal side that has three league games without to win and with so much pressure on the title race, at times it was definitely a bit of fear in our performance, respecting Chelsea and the counter-attacking threats. Arsenal grew into the game and in the second half there was a lot more dominance. A key reason behind that was returning captain Martin Odegaard. In his first Arsenal start since August, playing all 90 minutes, producing a 7.6 rating with one assist, four key passes and two big chances created. Odegaard created more chances than any other player on the pitch, twice as many to be specific. Up against a Chelsea side that of course have Cole Palmer, another very creative number 10. Martin Odegaard showed him levels, dictating the Arsenal attacks once again, dropping down deeper and being so influential. It wasn't even the best Odegaard performance, yet still the influence was undeniable. The prime example being the assist for Gabriel Martinelli, a lovely pass over the top to make Arsenal's best chance of the game. Not only were Arsenal better on the ward Odegaard there, but it was more the off the ball as well, able to press and cause a lot of turnovers in the first half. When you think about Martin Odegaard being the Arsenal captain, there's a lot of talk of him not being that vocal leader. But if you ever watch him closely in the game itself, you'll notice that's not actually very true. He is almost the manager on the pitch, always demanding players and pointing them where to be. For an Arsenal attack that had not scored in the last two games, Odegaard has now created 62 open play chances in 2024, the highest in the Premier League over Palmer, Diaz and Fernandez. You then think about the Arsenal midfield developing into this season, a very impressive cameo for Mikel Marino that we're going to break down. Having a fully fit Martin Odegaard will be the catalyst if Arsenal have anything left this year. But talk to me down below in the comments on your thoughts on the performance. Tactically alone, did you think Arsenal did enough to warrant getting three points? Moving on to the second thing, Martinelli's move. At a ground that he once famously made his name, all the way back in 2020 under Mikel Arteta, their famous celebration as Kante was left on the floor. In this game, he definitely had his moments. The example in the first half, of course, that massive opportunity. The ball falling to him on the left hand side and a chance that many Arsenal fans think he should have taken. To the fans that I was speaking to, there was definitely a bit of unrest growing. Despite Martinelli trying, he wasn't actually causing Gusto that many issues. At times reluctant to take it out wide and burst past his man. He was cutting inside quite often and maybe lacking a bit of confidence. But football is a funny game because come the second half, it was Martinelli who scored the opening goal. Once again crashing at that far left hand side found by a lovely pass from Martin Odegaard. Gabriel Martinelli scored his third Premier League goal of the season. In terms of the rating though, it was only a 6.9, with two shots on target and one big chance missed. 11 accurate passes and only two ground goals won. When you think about the way that the Arsenal team is developed, you've got the two technicians on the right hand side, Bukayo Saka and Martin Odegaard, two ball to feet players that are able to attract players towards them. The effect that has is often Gabriel Martinelli is left alone able to isolate his fullback and create dangerous opportunities. This was Arsenal's go-to chance creation method in this game. Think about all the chances that Arsenal had. It was always across the right hand side finding a player on the left. That's where Mikel Arteta will be looking once again in the transfer market. With previous pursuits of Mikhailo Modric and of course Nico Williams, as great as Gabriel Martinelli is potentially, I actually think in terms of a pure wide forward there are better options available in the market. More natural wingers that can make the most out of the space they are given, and more importantly attract players away from Saka and Martin Odegaard, made the Arsenal attack as threatening on the left hand side as it is the right. This for me is a major year for Gabriel Martinelli where he needs to find form as soon as possible. 
The impact might be there, but is it enough for Mikel Arteta to not have to enter the market for a winger? In terms of Martinelli, he has been called up to the Brazil national team for this upcoming international break replacing Rodrigo. But in a game that was all about moments, the one that I want to focus on now is Pedro Neto. Having caused Ben White a few issues in the first half on the left-hand side, with the arrival of Mikhailo Modric, he went over to the right and that's where he caused the most issues. The example being in the 69th minute, cutting inside and given so much space. Yes, it was a tremendous finish and you have to say fair play. But when you look at this image here, it is a bit concerning. Where were both Thomas Partey and Declan Rice? Why was he not closed down? If you actually watch the reaction to Gabriel Magalhaes after Arsenal concede, you can see that he has the same feeling. Annoyed at the Arsenal midfielders for not closing Neto down. It's weird because in terms of defensively, I think Arsenal overall were perfectly fine. With Saliba and Gabriel dominating the likes of Jackson and Cole Palmer, Saliba has now made it 25 tackles this season without getting dribbled past a single time. No other player in the league has made even 15 tackles without getting dribbled past. Despite of that though, Arsenal have now gone 7 games without a clean sheet for a title charge that was built around our defence last season. Our ability to win their duels and be so aggressive out of possession. We might not be conceding chances, but it doesn't mean there's not been a bit of a drop off. A lack of intensity in terms of closing players down. These are the fine margins that matter the most to Mikel Arteta. Whether there's a lack of urgency or getting too comfortable. What do you guys make of it? Was the Pedro Neto goal avoidable in the Arsenal perspective? Moving on to the third thing, the missing piece. In a game that many Arsenal fans, including your boy, thought was a must win if we were to stay in a title race. Despite Chelsea having the odd occasions and the most part Arsenal started to dominate towards the second half, sustaining pressure and making a few fantastic chances. From a lovely ball from Bukayo Saka towards Mikel Marino, inches away from scoring straight after coming on, to the final moments of the game, the 95th minute. William Saliba playing as a left winger, Arsenal desperate to score a winner. Somehow finding himself free, he cuts the ball back and Trossard misses it, taking the ball away from Kai Havertz who's about to score a tap in. The reaction of Mikel Arteta tells you everything, dropping to the floor in disbelief. There's been a lot of talk of if Saliba was offside or onside, but with no flag from the linesman, it actually means the chance was registered. With further images coming out after the game, showing that Saliba may have actually been onside. Not only is it an awful miss from the under the trossard, but think about the moment for Kai Havert. Having scored a goal in the first half against his former side, but ruled out to a narrow offside, a chance to score the winner against a former club and give Arsenal a major boost in the title race. Some people will look at that and say that I'm being picky, but my brothers, we have been in a title race for the past two years. Whether it's Man City or Liverpool this year, how many times have these fine margins cost us? We go back to the chance of Mikel Marino, a chance created by Bukayo Saka straight after he missed the ball. Saka was seen saying, how have you not scored? It's because these players realise the importance of these fine margins, the potential difference between finishing first and second. The ending of this game for me highlighted a bigger concern. When you think about Bukayo Saka dropping a 6.4 rating, 81 minutes of a tough battle against Kukurea, the stats might say zero key passes, but we all know that's not quite true with the chance that he created for Mikel Marino. My problem though is the fact that once he went off injured, we might have Odegaard, you might have Havertz and Trossard. They are all fantastic players, but do they have the unstoppable attacking quality, that sense of inevitability, that they were going to find a way to score a very pivotal goal in the title race? Turn the title in Arsenal's favour in what was a must-win game. You look at Man City and Erling Haaland, Liverpool, Mo Salah, those are what you call unstoppable attacking players. In games where the teams might concede chances, not be at their best, they're somehow able to still provide that moment. Mikel Arteta's tactics are often amazing. But the issue is with a few tactical tweaks. I also don't have that get out of jail card. All the eyes for me now turn to the January transfer window. With Arsenal currently 9 points off top place Liverpool. Many fans already giving up on the title race. Having not spent majorly in the summer, for me there is still a major gap there. A chance to be ambitious and sign a profile that will provide the unstoppable attacking quality needed in games like this. With those Benjamin Shesko or Victor Jokeres, the missing profile for me is becoming obvious. Moving on to the fourth thing, Marino's masterclass. In an Arsenal game where you had a very strong starting midfield, Thomas Partey, Declan Rice and Martin Odegaard, the fact that Declan Rice was playing for a broken toe was never ideal. So come the second half, it wasn't a surprise that he turned to a certain Mikel Marino. And despite quite a few fans being nervous, Marino actually produced one of his best Arsenal performances. A 7.0 rating in 19 minutes, 16 accurate passes and one accurate long ball, alongside one successful dribble and three out of four ground balls. In his first appearance alongside Martin Odegaard, he was actually playing as a natural left number eight. Put in an environment that maximised his strengths, it's actually a bit weird the fact that he was thriving more when under pressure. Turning and twisting, playing his way out of pressure. We saw his ability to crash the box as well, the prime example being the chance he had. It finally felt like we saw what Mikel Arteta was chasing in the summer. That natural left eight that also didn't have last season. A profile comfortable at receiving the ball deeper, attracting players towards him and firing off incisive passes. Despite all the negativity around the result in the title race, the arrival of Marino alongside Martin Odegaard 
Declan Rice hopefully available after the international break and Thomas Partey returning to his best form. If Arsenal have any chance remaining in this title race, these players will be the pivotal ones. And in terms of their left hand side, we've talked about Gabriel Martinelli, but let's also talk about Yuri and Timber. Starting as a left back against a very dangerous Madueke, dropping a 6.8 rating, with one clearance, two block shot and one interception. Two ground balls, one out of five. What was very intriguing for me was the fact that he actually wasn't playing as a left back at times, as perfectly shown by his heat map. A lot of Timber's touches were actually coming in the half spaces, with the idea behind that being a rotation with Declan Rice. Slotting into left back allowing Timber to move centrally, it was Mikel Arteta trying to maximise the ability of Yuri and Timber when receiving the ball, comfortable at turning and causing issues. The example being the run in the second half where he burst past a few Chelsea players, producing a shot on his chance all by himself. It was only after Mikel Marino came on that Timber dropped back into left back, but the issue with that is the fact that he's right footed means Arsenal become a bit limited in the build up phase. So that's why we're looking to Ricardo Calafiori. Seen in the crowd watching his Arsenal teammates, currently out with a knee injury, Mikel Arteta has already confirmed the injury isn't that serious. Having that natural left foot on the left hand side once again could be pivotal if we see the best of Marino and Martinelli and allowing Timber to move back to the right hand side. Moving on to the fifth thing, a moment of uncertainty. It is a bit of a weird time to be an Arsenal fan. After a lot of promise going into the season and a very strong start, wins against Aston Villa away and Spurs away, moments away from winning at the Etihad. But then no league win since the win against Southampton, dropping now 6 points in our opening 11 games. Arsenal are currently 4 league games without a win. Despite of that, our last two performances have definitely been better, as Arsenal now make it 14 big 6 games without a single defeat. I don't think Arsenal fans really care about that, what they care about is a title race. So after another dramatic week where Man City lost to Brighton 2 goals to 1, making it 4 defeats in a row for the first time ever under Pep Guardiola. Since the start of last year, they have now lost 5 of 13 games without Rodri, with their next 3 games being Spurs, Liverpool and Ungham Forest. But after dropping points once again, fans see this game as a missed opportunity. As good as a side as Chelsea may be, for an Arsenal side that have dropped so many points in games they shouldn't have, even a draw feels like a loss. Especially because of the form of Liverpool after beating Villa 2 goals to nil. In terms of the Premier League table, they have currently moved 9 points clear of Arsenal, 5 clear of City, sat in 1st place on 28 points. Liverpool fans and your boy aren't on the best of terms right now, but in terms of their performances, you cannot deny it. Finding a way to get the job done, even when chances go against them. In the game, they created a 2.3 XG and Villa created 1.6. Whether it's luck or great goalkeeping, they're finding a way to get the results. They have lost only one game all season, that being Nottingham Forest. And the way they got the win against Villa kind of shows what Arsenal don't have. Despite Emery Sine making a lot of chances and causing so many issues, with the inevitability of Mo Salah, they were still able to get the three points. Finding a way to win a game despite not being at their best. For Mikel Arteta, as much as he tries to make these games as close as possible, with the overlines on Bukayo Saka and just returning Martin Odegaard, if those players get cut off, Arsenal aren't able to find other solutions. So then it all poses the question of what about the title race? For someone like your boy who's often so optimistic about Arsenal being there, being 9 points off with 27 games to go is definitely not where you want to be. A lot of Arsenal fans are cutting that it may be over, but as Arne Schlott says, it was Mikel who said and I agree with him completely, Arsenal have had many many difficult away games already and had to play them with 10 men as well. We've had difficult games, but only really United away and Arsenal away as ones you expect to be in the top 6. That for me is my one hope and saving glory. The fact that we've gone to Villa away, Spurs away, City away and now Chelsea away with 8 points out of a possible 12. With the league being more competitive than ever before, I still firmly believe that no team is going to reach 90 plus points this season. Watching City drop points in games they wouldn't do last season. Liverpool right now may be the favourites with 27 games to go. If there's one thing that Arsenal fans have learned over the past few seasons, the team that starts fastest doesn't always go on to win the title. All you have to do is look at the table after 22 games last year. Liverpool were 5 points clear above Arsenal and City, yet ended up finishing third on 82 points. But let me know your thoughts in the comments, do you think that Arsenal still have a chance for this title? In terms of Mikel Arteta, he says he's found this season an absolute nightmare because of fitness and injury issues. So as we approach the final international break in a while, Mikel Arteta says there's nothing I can do about that, I am just praying that after the international break, I have the team fit as I want, because it's been an absolute nightmare. In a game that you had both Declan Rice and Bukayo Saka go off, despite them being a part of the England squad, don't be surprised if they get taken out. Because post international break, we have must win game after must win game. Forest at home and Sporting away, West Ham away, United at home, then Fulham away and Monaco at home. Times are tough as Arsenal fans right now, but all we can do is hope for the best and see if this team is able to produce an almighty winning streak. But that is the video there and there, so hopefully you guys have enjoyed. If you have, don't forget to smash a like and also subscribe to the channel if you are new. If you want to follow your boy on social media, then the links are down below in the description. But that was the five things we learned from Chelsea 1, Arsenal 1. It was not the one that so many Arsenal fans wanted. But with the international break now here, maybe we book a trip to Dubai. Let's see what happens anyways. I'll see you guys very soon. Take care. In a bit.